Hello, everyone. I am Martin Andrews, Communication Director at InquireEd, and thank you so much for coming today. Welcome to our webinar, The Case for Elementary Social Studies Knowledge Building. After we finished here today, you'll receive an email with a link to a blog that has a summary of the content we've discussed and a video of the webinar, as well as any links or resources that we share. So don't worry about trying to copy those all down. We are going to get you what you need tomorrow in an email. Also, feel free to share that out with others and they can watch the webinar as well. The email will also include a link to a request for a certificate of attendance if you would like one of those. For those of you just joining us, welcome. I see uh, participants being added. Thank you so much for coming today during the course of today's session. If you have any questions or comments, just share them in the chat. Um, I'm going to be in there in the chat here shortly, uh, monitoring that and, and uh, engaging with you. So please, if you have questions, share them as they come to you. If we don't address them right away, we'll take time to examine them at the end of our session. Today's webinar, The Case for Elementary Social Studies, is part of a three-part series that InquireEd and the National Council for Social Studies is uh, sponsoring. So our first, very first webinar in the series was the ELA uh, connection where we had Adam Tyner from the Fordham Institute on talking about a really amazing research study that they just published a few months ago. You can go and you can check that out. I'll send you a link for that past uh, webinar. Today's is about knowledge building and uh, we're going to get to that in here in a second. And then we have a, another one, a third part in December, where we sit down with district leaders from Chicago Public Schools, from Detroit Public Schools, other places, and we ask them how they are advocating for, how they are promoting, how they are mandating elementary social studies within their districts. So you're not going to want to miss that one either. So you can sign up for that on our inquired.org webinar info. And uh, please check out that last one as well. As I mentioned, this webinar series is brought to you by the National Council for the Social Studies. Founded in 1921, it's the largest professional association in the country devoted solely to social studies education. And take a look at this slide. They have their national conference coming up, a highlight for social studies teachers across the country. Obviously this year, we're not going to be able to get together and to be in that convention hall and to be in those spaces, but being virtual, allows for quite a slate of speakers and presenters. Take a look at just a few of those people that are coming. It's gonna be really exciting. So if you haven't signed up for NCSS 2020, go to socialstudies.org and please sign up. Of course, this series is also brought to you by InquireEd. InquireEd has a K-6 elementary social studies curriculum called Inquiry Journeys where we move beyond the textbook and these lessons and units that students experience, uh, they support culturally responsive instruction, they promote inquiry-based teaching and learning, they're aligned to national social studies and ELA standards, and the subject of our webinar today, they build background knowledge and skills. So uh, check out uh, inquired.org if you'd like to find out more about that. So, you know, a little bit about the sponsors, we wanna know a little bit about you before I introduce you to our panelists. So I wanna know what your role is in the educational landscape. Are you an instructional coach, a elementary teacher, a high school teacher, a curriculum lead? Uh, so I'm gonna launch a poll right now that lets us find out who is in our audience. So I'm launching that poll right now. Uh, and go ahead and fill that in. And once we have around 80% of you uh, who have filled it out, I know lots of you wear multiple hats too. So go ahead and choose uh, as many of these uh, roles that apply to you. So lots of elementary teachers, lots of curriculum leads, instructional support, we're at 70%. And I am going to end that here in a second and then share so you can see 
who is in the audience with you today. So I'm gonna end this poll and share the results. So it looks like we've got lots of curriculum leads out there who probably want to advocate for elementary social studies. So you have come to the right webinar because that is exactly what we want you to do. And we have elementary teachers, some middle school teachers, a really uh, wide range of people. Whoever you are, we hope that you um, can get something out of today's webinar and uh, advocate for elementary social studies. I'm gonna stop my share right now and introduce you first to Shanti Ellen Govin. She is the CEO of Inquire Ed, and she is here today to participate in this webinar, ask our other panelists some questions. So Shanti, I'm gonna kind of turn it over to you and I'm gonna disappear into a chat world and, um, and interact with our participants. Thank you, Martin. And I think we're getting some in the moment feedback that we need to add higher education to oh, our oh. role there. Yeah, in the chat. So we're, well, I think that's something we'll need to add, which is very relevant. Um, so thank you everyone for being here today. I'm excited to be here and I'm very excited and honored, honestly, to introduce Natalie Wexler to all of you. Um, Natalie Wexler is an education writer and the author of The Knowledge Gap, The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It. She also is the co-author with Judith C. Hockman of The Writing Revolution, a guide to advancing thinking through writing in all subjects and grades, and a senior contributor to the education channel on Forbes.com. Her articles and essays on education and other topics have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Atlantic and other publications. She has spoken on education before a wide variety of groups and appeared on a number of TV and radio shows, including Morning Joe and NPR's On Point and 1A. She holds a BA from Harvard University, an MA in history from the University of Sussex, and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania. And she's worked as a reporter, a Supreme Court law clerk, a lawyer, and a legal historian. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and has two adult children. Natalie, thank you so much for being here. We're really honored to have you on um, and talk with us today. Well, thank you, Shanti. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm going to plunge right in because I I have a lot of ground to cover and uh, I want to be sure to leave time for questions. So here goes. Um, let me just get this started. Okay, so um, I thought I'd start by just uh, pointing out that, so I'm going to be talking about, about the knowledge gap, what it is and how social studies can narrow it. Um, and um, you know, I thought I'd start by just pointing out that our reading scores in this country have been stagnant or declining for at least 20 years. And in addition, the gap between our highest and lowest scores has only grown instead of narrowing. Um, as you can see, 2019, there were 30% of students were below basic on the NAEP reading score. And that was an increase over the previous administration. At the same time, we are seeing on national tests of the subjects included in social studies, pretty dismal results in civics, geography, US history. The, this is the percent of students scoring proficient on these tests. In US history, there's only 15% in 2018 who scored proficient or above on the US history tests, which was a decline from the previous administration. Um, Eight, from 18% to 15%. And the other results are nothing to write home about either. Now, I'm gonna argue that there is actually a connection between these reading score results and these uh, civics, geography, and US history results. And what I'm talking about really is the fact that in elementary school especially, we've had a narrowing curriculum as reading and math tests have become more and more important. These other subjects have been marginalized or even eliminated from the curriculum in many schools. And social studies is usually the first to go along with the arts, science to a lesser extent. Now, it's not because teachers don't want to teach those things. In fact, um, this survey done last year showed that educators think teaching social studies and science in the elementary grades is important. Um, they think, if you look at this, these graphs, they think uh, 
it's important to understanding text, to their interest in these fields, their reading comprehension in the future, and their reading behavior. And yet, they're not really spending much time on these subjects. Why is that? Because basically they see the need to prepare for tests as a major barrier to doing this. You wanna boost scores on reading tests, spend more time on reading. So you'll see the need to prepare for state tests. And these, by the way, these are K to three teachers along with school leaders and district leaders. 62% of district leaders, for example, saw the need to prepare for state tests as a major barrier to spending more time on social studies and science. In fact, though, as we've recently learned from that Fordham study in particular, um, more time on social studies is correlated with higher reading test scores, but more time on reading is not. So that, that sounds counterintuitive. I mean, why would that be? Well, to understand the answer, we need to look at how we go about teaching reading in this country. And of course, reading has two basic components. There's what's known as decoding, which is uh, basically reading words, sounding out words. That should be taught as a set of foundational skills phonemic awareness, which is hearing the sounds in words, and then phonics, connecting those sounds to the letters that represent them. Fluency, being able to do that at an appropriate pace with appropriate expression. We do have major problems in this country with the way we teach decoding, but I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about the way we teach the other basic aspect of reading, comprehension. Obviously, you need both to be a good reader. You need to be able to read the words and understand what they mean. And I would argue that the way we teach comprehension, um, there are even bigger problems with that than the way we teach decoding, and they are better hidden. So what is the standard approach to teaching reading comprehension? Well, essentially, it's conceived of as a set of skills and strategies, comprehension skills and strategies, like identifying the main idea and details, making inferences, and there usually will be a skill or strategy of the week that the teacher will demonstrate on a book chosen not for its content, but for how well it uh, lends itself to demonstrating whatever the skill of the week is. And then the other part of this approach is that the students basically scatter to read books that have been determined to be at their own individual reading level, and that's what they'll practice the skill on. And their individual reading level could be years below their grade level. So they could be told you're a level L, which is a second grade level, but they're actually in fourth or fifth grade. They will be directed to a basket of books at level L or whatever their level is. And uh, again, these books are not organized basically by topic. They're just organized by, they've been term determined to be easy enough for kids to read on their own at their own level. And the theory here is that if you get really good at finding the main idea, say, or one, uh, one of these skills, you will become a better reader. You will be able to apply that skill at finding the main idea to any text that's put in front of you, whether it's a passage on an end of the year reading test or a textbook down the road in high school. So let's quickly test out that theory. Um, I'm gonna show you a paragraph from a newspaper and just ask you to find the main idea, and I'm sure you're all expert readers, so this shouldn't be a challenge. Much depended on the two overnight batsmen, but this duo perished either side of lunch, the latter a little unfortunate to be a judged leg before, and with Andrew Simons, too, being shown the dreaded finger off an inside edge, the inevitable beckoned, bar the pyrotechnics of Michael Clark in the ninth wicket. So I'm guessing that you are having trouble not only finding the main idea, as I would be, but also just figuring out what this paragraph is trying to tell you. And what I didn't mention was that this paragraph was taken from a British newspaper, and uh, it's describing a cricket match. So if you were a cricket fan, you would have no trouble understanding this. Uh, you know, other people who don't know about cricket, they might know what leg means and what before means, but they don't know what it means to be a judged leg before. If you're a cricket fan, you just know that. 
Now, this is something that cognitive scientists have known about for a long time now. Back in the late 1980s, for example, and, and there are other studies like this, but this was a sort of landmark study. And the question was, what is more important in reading comprehension? Is it general reading ability or skill, comprehension skill, or is it how much you know about the topic you're reading about? And basically what they found was, this was a bunch of seventh and eighth graders. Um, they divided them into groups according to how well they had done on the standardized reading test and how much they knew about baseball. And then they gave them a passage describing a baseball game and tested their comprehension. And they found that really knowledge of baseball was what determined how well these kids did on a reading comprehension test. The kids who were supposedly poor readers but knew a lot about baseball did much better than the kids who were supposedly good readers but didn't know anything much about baseball. And so what this study and others like it tell us are a couple of things. One is that comprehension skills aren't skills like riding a bike. It's not just keep practicing them and you get better. It depends on the context. And secondly, there's no such thing as a fixed reading level. It's gonna depend on the topic and how much the reader knows about that topic. So this clearly shows that knowledge of the topic is a key factor in co reading comprehension. Well, why is that? It has to do with working memory, which is like short-term memory, like consciousness, basically, um, the things to know about working memory are that it can only hold a few things for a very limited period of time, just a few seconds. And the more you're trying to juggle in working memory when you're reading something or even listening to something, the harder it's going to be for you to devote cognitive capacity to just understanding it. You're going to be thinking, what does that word mean? What does this word mean? Maybe trying to look things up and you lose your train of thought. So the more you can withdraw information from long-term memory, which is virtually infinite, the more capacity you're gonna have in working memory for understanding for things like that and for analysis. So the more information you have stored in long-term memory, the more brain power you have for things like comprehension. Now, how is this all connected with social studies or with the gap in test scores? Well, basically, authors leave out information in any writing, um, and that includes passages on reading tests. They make certain assumptions about what readers will know. And uh, the passages on reading tests, as you may be aware, are not connected to anything that kids might have learned in school. They're supposed to be disconnected from that because the ideas were just testing your reading ability your ability to find the main idea. We're not testing your knowledge. But if you don't have enough knowledge to understand the reading passage in the first place, you're not gonna get a, a chance to demonstrate your skills like finding the main idea. And the information from social studies can really help fill in a lot of those gaps that, in knowledge that you know, authors are assuming the reader is going to be able to fill. So let's take a, a look at an actual uh, passage from a third grade park test. This is a reading comprehension test. And I'll go ahead and read this. Um, in one of the most remote places in the world, the Canadian Arctic, a people have survived over a thousand years. They are the Inuit. For the Inuit, the Arctic is a place teeming with life. Depending on how far north they live, the Inuit find everything from caribou herds and polar bears to beluga whales. Now, that might seem pretty straightforward to us as educated adults, but here's that same passage without the words and phrases that a lot of third graders may not know. And if you're missing that much information, this paragraph is as difficult to understand as that cricket paragraph was a few slides ago. Now, obviously, some kids, some third graders will know these words and phrases. They tend to be the third graders who've been able to pick up that kind of vocabulary and information at home. The others are the ones who really depend on school for that. Um, and unfortunately, with our narrowing curriculum, they're the least likely to get it there because in schools where test scores are the lowest, which tend to have higher poverty populations, they're the ones who have cut back on social studies the most. And if you look at what's missing from this paragraph, these are concepts that you're most likely to get 
from social studies, uh, certainly not really from random reading uh, on books that are just easy for you to read that you may be choosing, which is what, how many third graders are spending their school day. But it's, it's not just reading that's important to literacy. Um, it's also listening and discussion. Those things really are crucial in building knowledge and vocabulary. Why is that? Well, listening is important because kids, not just young kids, but really on average through about age 13, their listening comprehension exceeds their reading comprehension. That means they can take in more sophisticated concepts and vocabulary through listening than through their own reading. And that's going to help build the knowledge really efficiently that they need when it comes time for them to read more complex text. They will already be familiar with those concepts, that vocabulary. They'll have an easier time, as we know from the baseball study, understanding things. And discussion is hugely important as a way of getting that knowledge to stick. Um, this has, happens to be from a second grade class that I followed through the school year where they were following a, an atypical curriculum that included a lot of so what we would consider social studies content. And that content gives rise to much richer discussions than let's talk about the skill of finding the main idea or determining the author's purpose. First, second graders really don't have much to say about those quote unquote skills, which of course are not really skills. I mean, these kids were having rich discussions about things like Alexander the Great, the War of 1812, all sorts of things uh, that they were very engaged in talking about and they were learning very sophisticated vocabulary through listening and discussion. Another thing that's really crucial to literacy that gets overlooked is writing. That is potentially a hugely powerful lever for, for building all sorts of knowledge and skills. Writing can build and deepen knowledge, familiarize students with the conventions of written language, and that helps boost reading comprehension, develop their analytical abilities, talk about having to find the main idea. If you have to construct a topic sentence, that's what you have to figure out. It's so powerful, it can really compensate for gaps in background knowledge, even at upper grade levels when those gaps are widest. But there's an important caveat here. It's the hardest thing we ask students to do. And so if we just ask students to write, chances are they'll, they won't be able to learn to write well and they won't really get these benefits from writing. It'll be too overwhelming. So what do we have to do to exploit the tremendous potential of writing to build knowledge and reading comprehension and analytical abilities? Two things. One, we need to embed explicit writing instruction in the content of the curriculum, and that particularly includes social studies. Uh, that gives us really very fertile ground for a lot of writing. Um, and if it, all too often these days, we ask students to write about things that have nothing to do with the content of the curriculum. Um, your trip to the amusement park last weekend, or let's should we have chocolate milk in the cafeteria? Uh, if writing can build knowledge, we should be using it to build knowledge of what we want kids to learn about. Secondly, in order to lighten that tremendous cognitive load that writing places on inexperienced writers, we need to begin writing instruction at the sentence level. And that's true no matter what the grade level is. There are plenty of high school students who are inexperienced writers because no one's ever really taught them how to write a good sentence. And if you can't write a good sentence, you're going to struggle to write a good paragraph or a good essay. So there's only one method I know of that combines both of these things, and that's the writing revolution. Um, this is a book that I co-authored with a, a veteran educator, Judith Hockman, who really came up with this method of teaching writing and content and analytical skills at the same time. And I, I don't have time right now to tell you about this in much depth, but I'm just going to show you, give you a taste of it. I'm going to give you an example of one of the sentence level activities that is part of this method, which goes beyond the sentence level, goes through argumentative essays, but it does start unusually at the sentence level. So there's a, an activity called because, but, and so. Let's say you are a social studies or history teacher and you're teaching about the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. You could give your students three different 
sentence stems, the beginning of sentences, this that beginning would be the same, but students would need to finish it with these three different conjunctions, requiring them not only to learn how to use conjunctions, but also to think about what they've learned in different ways and put it into their own words, thereby really boosting their comprehension and retention. So you could do this. Abraham Lincoln was a great president because he kept the North united during the Civil War. That could be an answer supplied by the student. Abraham Lincoln was a great president, but many Americans didn't like him while he was alive. Abraham Lincoln was a great president, so more books have been written about him than any other American leader. So those are just examples. There are obviously other things that students could supply, but this, this is a taste of what that method entails. So you might ask, well, what's wrong with waiting until middle school or high school, to, which often happens, uh, to start teaching history and geography? Well, the problem is that um, it's not just that prior knowledge helps you understand what you read, it also helps you absorb and retain new information. And that's something that's been overlooked. Our, our approach has been that kids need to first learn to read, and then once they've learned to read, they can read to learn. They can read a textbook like this and gain knowledge from it because they've mastered those comprehension skills. And, and what this overlooks is that part of learning to read is actually acquiring the knowledge and vocabulary that will enable you to understand a book like this. Um, and it's, it's been said that knowledge is like Velcro. Uh, it sticks best to other related knowledge. So if you start out with more knowledge and vocabulary, then you're able not only to read more sophisticated books, but also to retain, you have a better chance of retaining new information and vocabulary from those books. And that enables you in turn to read yet more sophisticated books. So for kids who start out with more knowledge and vocabulary, that's a cycle that can work. But for kids who start out with less knowledge and vocabulary, they're restricted to simpler books. And they have less of that other half of the Velcro that enables new information to stick. So they fall farther and farther behind their more advantaged peers every year that they stay in school. And students with more highly educated parents are the ones who start out with more Velcro. So this has led to what's been called the Matthew effect. Uh, that's a reference to the gospel of St. Matthew and the line that basically says the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And so by the time kids get to high school, the gap between those good readers and poor readers would be very wide if, uh, if nobody's been building the knowledge and vocabulary for those poor, quote unquote poor readers. And the problem is that it can look like that skills and strategies approach is actually working at lower grade levels. It can look like kids are getting better at finding the main idea, but that's largely because the texts, the books that they're reading don't assume very much background knowledge. And what happens is when they get to higher grade levels and more background knowledge is assumed, that's when they hit a wall and really start to struggle. Um, so this gap between good readers and poor readers can be huge by the time kids get to high school. But there's also another gap that really becomes obvious there. And that's the gap between what we assume high school students know and what many do know. Um, you know, we give them a book like this to read. And yet, you know, I've talked to teachers in high poverty high schools who've told me they've had kids at all levels of ability, but they say it's not uncommon for kids in high school not to know some very basic things like the difference between a city and a state or a country and a continent, how to find the United States on a map of the world or their hometown on a map of the United States. They lack a sense of historical chronology. It's not because they can't learn these things, it's because no one has taught them these things. And yet we hold them essentially accountable for knowing those things. And that can be a very frustrating experience, not just for the students, but also for their teachers. So I, I also wanted to know when I wrote this book, uh, not just what the problem was, but what 
can we do about all this? And the good news is that there is a lot that we can do. Um, and one of the basic things that schools can do is to spend more time on social studies, especially in the early grades and particularly history and geography and spend at least a couple of weeks on each topic. Uh, too often when there is some social studies in the, uh, the elementary grades, especially the early el elementary grades, it's very superficial. It's um, maybe, you know, jumping around from one topic to another or treating a topic that's very broad in a very superficial way. So how do we do this? Well, this can be done through a high quality social studies curriculum like inquire eds or given the difficulty sometimes of getting schools to devote time to social studies rather than the ela or literacy block in some places schools have been adopting an ela or literacy curriculum that incorporates social studies topics like uh, the classroom that i followed through a school year so here are just a few examples of some of those newer literacy curricula. But even if you have one of those literacy curricula in place, it's even better to also have a high quality social studies curriculum. It's not like you're really going to overdo the social studies. Um, so both of those things is really the ideal combination. I'd just like to finish actually with um, an anecdote I heard while I was researching the book, The Knowledge Gap, that I think illustrates the power of social studies, uh, illustrates um, the fallacies of these individual reading levels, and also shows the power of curriculum to change teachers' expectations. You know, we hear a lot about the importance of high expectations, and they are important. But what I've seen in many cases when I've spoken to teachers are teachers who do have high expectations but do not have the materials that will enable their students to meet those high expectations. So this story, it goes like this. Um, I heard about a second grade teacher at a school that had recently adopted uh, one of those literacy curricula that, that included social studies topics and really went into depth on them. And she was giving one of her second graders a, a test to determine his individual reading level. Uh, and this was a kid who was struggling like crazy with reading. And she saw in the testing kit, which had a bunch of different texts that she could choose from, there was a text on westward expansion. And that happened to be the topic that the class had just spent two weeks learning about. But that text was at a fourth grade level, and this was a struggling second grade reader. But just out of curiosity, the teacher handed the text to the boy. And to her surprise, he read it with 98% accuracy and 100% comprehension. And I would argue that that experience changed that teacher's idea of who that kid was and what he was capable of. And I'm sure it also helped to change that boy's idea of who he was and what he was capable of. And that's one reason I feel so much urgency about this topic. Uh, we have been overlooking the tremendous potential of so many students for a long time. And we have been uh, damaging their self-image and self-esteem by making them feel like failures, making them feel like it's their fault that they're in the dumb group in reading when there's no good reason for that. So um, I'm going to stop there and um, would be happy to take questions from Shanti and anyone else. Thank you, Natalie. That was really great. Thanks for spending the time. Um, to, for our attendees, I'm going to spend a few minutes just asking Natalie a couple of questions, um, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A. So if you have questions, you can start putting them in, and I'm sure um, Martin, our Master of Ceremonies, will make sure to get to them. Um, so I wanted to start, you know, I think in education, we like to put things into camps. So we'll often say like, oh, it's all about this. You know, I, I kind of always use the analogy of the computer lab of like, oh, let's go teach computer lab over here. Now it's all about this thing. And so I, I think in, in the reading wars and when what people are talking about in literacy, there tends to be this kind of camp that's talking all about, that has been talking a lot about skills. This camp that's talking about background knowledge, this camp that's talking about phonics. And I think that somebody might glean from yours that you're in this background knowledge camp and not thinking about the other ones. And I wanted just to talk a little bit about thinking about skill development and background knowledge 
in, you know, like this, rather than thinking about them as two separate things. Right. Well, I mean, I think the word skills has to be unpacked. There are different uh, kinds of skills and it, it the word is is used to refer both to decoding skills and also to comprehension. And and as I try to demonstrate, I, th they are not the same kinds of skills. So um, I, with phonics, it, I think it you know it should be clear that it's absolutely essential that kids know how to read words if they're ultimately going to be able to read. And we need to. It's not like we don't need to pay attention to that. Phonics skills can be taught in isolation from content. They do get better with practice. That's really the best way to approach them. Comprehension skills, um, first of all, I would argue they're not uh, not really skills because when we, we think of skills, we think of something that's sort of generally applicable, right? But more like habits. I mean, yeah, we want, it's not like it's, you can never ask a kid to find the main idea of something or, or summarize something. Those are certainly perfectly valid things to do. What the problem is, if we try to just teach those things directly as skills on the theory, they can be applied generally. What we need to do is put content in the foreground and ask questions that require kids to develop those skills, or I would call them really habits. You know, you want them to get into the habit of thinking, so what's the main idea of this? Or, you know, well, do, do I really understand this? Can I relate it to other things? Those, those are very valuable habits to have. But if you don't have enough knowledge of the topic, you're not gonna be able to engage in them. You may realize, oh, I actually don't know enough about this to, to answer these questions. Um, so it's not an either or thing, um, skills versus knowledge. That, that, that's one point I would say. Uh, we need to be teaching those phonics skills simultaneously with building knowledge and those habits of, of mind those, uh, that, that kids were going to need to become good readers and good students. Uh, we can't wait to do those things but they're kind of on separate tracks. Um, now, that's not to say that, you know, if, if, you have, if you have background knowledge about a topic, yes, you may see a word and, and it's, it'll be familiar and that's gonna help you not only understand that word, but you may be able to, you may recognize it. But that's not a substitute for being able to sound words out uh, because you, know, you are going, all readers, all good readers actually do unconsciously rely on those kinds of phonic skills, which have, in order to, un, to decipher, to decode words that are unfamiliar. We don't, un, we don't, are not conscious of doing that because it's become so automatic, but we, you know, that's what enables us to do it. And if kids don't have that ability, they are definitely going to be at a disadvantage, no matter how much background knowledge they have. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit, actually, and I, I know we have a really kind of core social studies uh, um, following here at Inquire Ed, and I see some of this in the chat talking about it. And so I think that there's, a, the, you know, the series that we have here is called the Case for Elementary Social Studies, and what you've laid forth and the Fordham study lays forth is really focused on the need for background knowledge in terms of developing better readers and potentially better writers. Um, and but I know you're also a historian and a former Supreme Law, uh, Supreme Court law clerk. So I'm sure that you can tell us a little bit about your thoughts about how that, that knowledge extends beyond literacy outcomes. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think that it is partly what literacy outcomes extend to. Um, you know, it's if you're if you do not if you're not literate in a meaningful sense you are shut out from so much in our society um you know and our society is deprived of your potential and if you live in a democracy you know i mean it this is really really crucial for all of us democracies cannot function without a literate citizenry a literate electorate if you can't follow if you don't have enough background knowledge to follow the issues that are at stake, how can you responsibly exercise your, your 
duties as a citizen. Um, so I think that it is really, uh, you know, impossible to overstate how important this is. And not to mention also that we have seen in our society increasing inequity over the last several decades. Our it, the deficiencies of our education system are not the only reason for that. But if we don't act to correct those deficiencies, if we don't do what we can to level the playing field by giving all kids access to knowledge as early as possible, we will never have a more equitable society. Um, you know, I, it's, it, it's, I, I, it's not the only thing we need to do, but it is necessary to do this. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I see it as having tremendous repercussions. Our failure to start building knowledge at the elementary level, to, to start building knowledge, especially, I would say, of history, geography. There's been more attention paid to STEM subjects, and I have nothing against them, but the proportion of, of people who are gonna need scientific and technical knowledge in their lives, you know, it, it just pales in comparison to the pr proportion of us who will need to know the difference between a city and a state, you know, uh, some very basic things that, you know, even college students are shockingly uh, unaware of some pretty basic facts of American history and geography. And so are Amer many American adults. So uh, I just see this as something that uh, I, I don't completely understand how we have overlooked this for so long. Um, it just seems tr so obviously tremendously important to me. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll end with one more question and then I'll turn it over to the Q&A because I, I, I see it blowing up. I know there's a lot coming in from the audience. Um, and so, I, you know, a lot of the folks on this webinar, my guess is they believe in the value of social studies. They're, they're the people in their district that are saying, hey, this matters. They're the curriculum coordinator. They are the teacher. They're the ones saying it matters. But they're often tasked within a larger system of advocating for that idea. What, what would be your advice to them? What would you say, you know, here's how you get social studies instruction on the table? Well, I mean, it's a complicated argument in a way because what you're, you're saying is, uh, you know, I think you have to deal with this elephant in the room, which is the concern about test scores and reading test scores in particular. And, um, you have to make the argument that reading is not just about reading as we have defined it. Uh, you know, reading encompasses a lot of other things, as I mentioned, you know, discussion, listening, discussion, writing, but also, you know, building kids' knowledge. And you can point to the Fordham study. I mean, it's only one study. But I also think, you know, I mean, it's, it's a question of common sense that if, if you're going to have, if you're going to be asking kids to read passages that they can't understand because you haven't given them, you haven't equipped them with the knowledge, uh, you know, you may, they, third grade reading scores may be okay, but as the grade levels go up, take a look at what's happening to those reading scores. It's not that the, you know, eighth grade reading scores are be a function of just what happens in eighth grade. Eighth grade reading scores reflect everything that's been going on since kindergarten and probably before. Um, so, you know, we have to take a longer view here. And, um, and I, I think uh, teachers, as, as we, you know, as that study I showed some slides up showed, teachers actually want to teach social studies. They, un I, I've talked to many teachers who said, you know, my kids really like that stuff. Kids are more engaged in that than they are in let's practice determining author's purpose for the umpteenth time because the same skills come back year after year. So, you know, it's not that teachers don't want to do this and it's not that they don't, they have a sense that it's important, but they also have this sense that teaching these reading skills are more important. And I think if, you know, um, it's, it's really pointing out that there's no evidence to support that. And that, you know, a lot of teachers really prize student engagement for good reason. And I think one argument can be, you know, you want your students to be engaged, teach them stuff that actually interests them. And another thing to do, if possible, is to find a school that's, that is spending more time on social studies topics, visit that school, talk to the teachers at that, that, that school, 
see how engaged the kids are and see how much they're actually learning. That can be very powerful. Well, thank you, Natalie. Um, I do want to make sure there's time for audience Q&A. So I'm going to turn it back to Martin um, and have him uh, run us through our Q&A. Thank you, Natalie. I really appreciate it. Sure. Hey, thanks. Um, and we do have a lot of questions that have been um, shared in the chat. And if you're going to chat some questions, uh, I said this in the chat, chat them to panelists and attendees so we can, so everyone can see. And, uh, and we'll just take the, some of the questions that have already been asked. And Natalie, I'll direct some of these questions uh, to you. And then Shanti, I'll direct some to you too that seem to be sort of right up your alley as well. So one of the things um, that was asked is, are there other sort of peer reviewed studies or studies that you would direct someone to, Natalie, um, that could help them advocate for the social studies? Well, you know, um, there, there's a, there are definitely some. Um, we don't have like a randomized controlled trials. We don't have, we have a few, but um, that show the importance of building knowledge and how that results in higher reading test scores. And the reason for that is that building knowledge is this gradual cumulative process that extends over years. So you need longitudinal studies that extend over years. Plus the standardized tests are not tied to any particular knowledge. They're not tied to any particular curriculum. So you, your kids could know a lot about you know, the War of 1812 or whatever, but then they, they get a passage about the Inuit and they may or may not yet have acquired a minimum, you know, the critical mass of general academic knowledge and vocabulary that would enable them to answer those questions. So those are sort of the obstacles. But yeah, there's there have been, um, I don't know of any studies, particularly on social studies curricula, other than the Fordham study, which isn't a specific curriculum, but just time spent on social studies. There are a few studies um, showing uh, that using these literacy curricula, elementary literacy curricula that cover social studies topics can lead to a boost in reading test scores. Um, there's one, a couple that have been done on core knowledge language arts, which um, is one of those, and, and one that's been done on a curriculum called bookworms. So, but these curricula are basically very new. That's the other thing. So um, there hasn't really been enough time to gauge their effectiveness. I, I hope more studies will be done. Um, I think there are some underway. Um, and I think the other thing uh, that we can keep an eye on is what's going on in Louisiana where they are, um, are doing, they're experimenting with a new kind of reading test that is tied to topics both in their ELA and social studies curriculum. So that state, Louisiana has a state created ELA and social studies curriculum that is used by something like 80% of the classrooms in that state. So they're able to experiment with a test that instead of just sort of testing kids on whatever knowledge they happen to pick up, actually tests them not, not just on their recall, but also you know on their ability to analyze reading passages that are drawn from stuff they've learned in school. So I think it'll be interesting to keep an eye on what happens with that in the next over the next couple of years. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump in. There's a, there is a question about um, most of the data presented and I think it connects to what Natalie's talking about here. It says most of the data presented and I think is based on standardized tests that are completely being debunked by my colleague, Dr. Linda Dong Hammond and by lots of others who have issues with tests. And what can you say about that? I, I think that what the, and I don't want to put more in your mouth, so I'll say what I think about this, Natalie, is that there's, testing is a metric. It is, it is one metric of a lot of metrics. And unfortunately, a lot of attention has been put on that metric. And that attention on that metric, I think, has a large, has largely to do with the marginalization of subjects like social studies. A lot of the reason that we've seen social studies really leave the classroom has been that intense focus on those test scores and ELA and math. And so we're, we're, what, what the reason that we're talking about test scores in a lot of ways is not to say that they are the be all end all metric of everything that we are doing in the classroom and that this knowledge doesn't matter as Natalie talked about for your entire life. 
I think what we're saying is, is that in thinking about how we convince districts to really shift this pattern, and it is a metric, it does say like something's wrong here. There's something going on under the cover. You spent all of this time on this and you're not seeing this change. What's going on here? I think it, it's one metric for us to look at to help in terms of advocating for the social studies. Right. I don't know if Natalie, you agree with that. Right, I mean, I am not arguing that the reason to build kids' knowledge of history and geography is simply to boost reading test scores. I am definitely not arguing. The reading test scores, in a way, have been an obstacle to building kids' knowledge um, because we have misinterpreted what they do. Now, I am not against standardized tests, per se, because I do think that they uncovered a lot of hidden inequities in our education system. But they don't tell us what to do about those inequities what we need to do is look at standardized tests for what they actually measure. And to a large extent, what they measure is how much academic knowledge and vocabulary kids have been able to pick up. What they really tell us is not that we need to work on these skills of finding the main idea, et cetera, but that we need to build kids' knowledge. The kids who are in the groups that tend to do worse on these tests, I mean, you know, one big reason for that is that they have not been able to acquire the kind of academic knowledge and vocabulary that is assumed by the test passages. So I don't think we should be putting a lot of emphasis on standardized tests. I don't think we should be using them as a way to evaluate individual teachers' performances, et cetera. But they're telling us something. And we're just, we have misinterpreted what they're telling us. Yeah, um, we have a we have a couple questions that I want to um, to to get in before we have to go and and there's a question that I, I think I want to combine and uh, two two different questions and I'll I'll send it over to you uh, Shanti and then uh, Natalie if you want to comment as well we have two questions thoughts about school districts purchasing textbooks and workbook series for instructional purposes. And the reason why I, I think that's an important question is because we're talking about like uh, going deep into subjects. So I would like to hear your thoughts about specific textbook workbook approaches. Um, and I think that connects to another question that we had about um, the use of inquiry in the classroom uh, versus uh, just reading about things, but using that knowledge to actually investigate specific topics. So I'll send those questions to you, Shanti, and then um, pass, pass it on to Natalie. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that second part of the question about inquiry. Um, I think there's um, been a, uh, a mis- Help classification again, going back to the categories that we like to make in education of that inquiry or project based learning and things that are, are like, you know, that student centered space is, is over here and building background knowledge is over here. I, I believe that an inquiry based model is really to design to build background knowledge. So a lot about what our model of inquiry based learning, I can speak to ours, is really thinking about it, you know, Natalie talked about the inequities that exist in terms of knowledge. And so sometimes what can happen is there's an expectation. I've heard teachers say, well, my students don't know what this term means. Well, of course they, they haven't been, you haven't taught it, you know, and they haven't had an opportunity to learn it. And so rather than seeing it as a, you know, a pre-assessment is for determining where you might need to go deeper and things like that, but it's not the assessment to say, okay, my students aren't ready for this content. It's an opportunity to go deep. And so inquiry where you're going deep around topics rather than jumping around from, let's talk about you know this particular historical event this week and another event the next week, we're going really deep into what we call a Trying to build the background knowledge, to understand that vocabulary, to be able to walk away with you know, that knowledge beyond the test that might come at the end. And so that space of inquiry and, and sustained investigation and building a background knowledge is all in, in service to the idea of them taking some sort of action with that and in service to the idea of them walking away with that background knowledge. So I don't see these two things as different camps. And I really think that they can, that, that inquiry, and in my belief, is that inquiry is our best method for building that, that really deep knowledge of students going deep. 
and that application of knowledge actually really helps in them actually retaining that knowledge. I think in going to your first question and thinking about, um, remind me, give me, what was the first part of it? Textbook, workbook, oh, textbook, model yeah. of instruction. So I, I have uh, major opinions about textbooks. I think when we think about um, social studies, we, we often use the word uh, going beyond the text, the words going beyond the textbook at Inquire Ed. Um, I think that textbooks are a, can, often can be seen as a canon of knowledge. And I saw another question about a canon of knowledge and they're often coming from one perspective. And so again, I think there are camps cre being created that there's culturally responsive practice and then there's background knowledge or there's this or there's direct instruction. These things can be used together and there are opportunities for teachers to be able to contextualize content to their space. So how are they, what are their students doing with the knowledge that they've gained? What are those students, how do the students have voice in what they're doing? What are the practices and how are student, teachers building knowledge, discussion-based strategies, collaboration-based strategies, talk to learn, all of those strategies can be built into the idea of building background knowledge. The, again, these things aren't separate things. When we do a textbook model, I think we're missing something of a lot of what actually why background knowledge got put again to the side is people thought like, oh, all of the knowledge is in your phone, right? It's all here in my pocket, so I don't need knowledge. Well, actually you need knowledge and Sam Weinberg talks about this a lot is that you need knowledge to be able to access that knowledge. And so we've got to think about how are students looking at resources? So, so just like the skills, taking skills out here. So sometimes we'll teach media literacy over here and then we'll teach content over here. Well, how do students have the opportunity to grapple with sources that come from varied sources? How do we students have the opportunity to be represented with authentic sources that actually are coming from the groups that we're talking about, that they're not always being represented by a white author? that they're actually having the opportunity to speak for themselves. So I think we've got to go beyond textbooks to really ensure that we've got this wealth of resources out there now in the 21st century. It's our duty as curriculum developers to be able to curate those sources and provide them to teachers so they can make curated decisions for their context and their students. Natalie, I know there was, uh, <laughs> there was a lot in there to respond to. Is there something that you want to, want to grab onto? Um, yeah, a couple things. I mean, on the inquiry uh, part of that, um, I do think inquiry can be tremendously valuable in engaging students and, and getting them to think deeply. But um, I don't think it's the place to begin when, and I think this is partly what Shanti was saying, if, if students don't know anything yet about a topic, you know, I mean, just inquiry can be a very inefficient way of, of getting them to acquire knowledge. So I think Timing is important, and I think this is very tricky. Uh, you know, at what point do you say, okay, now you, the student, you've got enough information. I've provided you with the basic information, and now you need to start inquiring and, and digging on you shouldering more of the burden of doing that cognitive work. Um, and this can start, I mean, I, I saw some what I would call inquiry in that second grade classroom I followed just through questions that made kids really think deeply, like, was Alexander the Great's ambitious nature an inspiration to his followers or a flaw, you know? I mean, thinking about things from multiple perspectives. So I, I don't think inquiry has to be like, okay, here's a bunch of materials, get into groups and just figure things out on your own. Cause I don't think that is always gonna work. Um, Most times that's gonna be a disaster, uh, right? I think Inquire Ed would say that too, until students are much older and have a set of skills, that kind of inquiry, what, what we would call open inquiry, uh, doesn't, really, doesn't really apply, I think. When right. we talk about inquiry, we're talking about a highly structured inquiry, similar to the one that you mentioned. You give students the questions, you give them the materials, but you allow them, you create those student-centered strategies that then allow them to explore those materials in specific ways. Right, and I'm not, I wasn't trying to characterize inquiry Ed's approach. I, you know, this is, I've seen something like this in some classrooms I've been in where students are expected to do more of the lifting on their own than they are really equipped to do. Um, and on the textbook question, I think that sort of like 
Mel bleeds over into the question of whose knowledge, um, which is definitely a question that gets asked. And I would just, I just want to say, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not advocating any particular for any particular body of knowledge. There's no list that I, you know, but I think that um, there are really two questions here, and and uh, they're related, but to some extent separate. And one is, do you feel that it is crucial for all kids to have access? to knowledge from an early age. And if you answer that question in the affirmative, then, you know, it's not, you really have an obligation to figure out, well, okay, so what knowledge are we gonna provide? And if, if, if you feel a particular curriculum is not culturally responsive enough to your particular students, then supplement it or find another one or create, I mean, I think creating a curriculum is a, I, I, I don't think the teacher should be expected to do that on their own, but somebody out there should create a knowledge rich curriculum that will be responsive, that will meet their standards of cultural responsiveness. Um, I think we're, we are out of time now. Uh, and I feel like there's a lot of questions that we have in here that haven't been addressed and that's my work is to go into this chat and take a look at what the questions were and to try to send you an email tomorrow that links to a blog post with answers to some of those questions with links. Um, Natalie, I'm gonna follow up with you with some of the links to the studies that you talked about that I think people really wanna to use to advocate for the social studies and any other things that we mentioned here will be linked in the blog post. We'll have a uh, recording of the webinar as well. I wanna thank you so much, Natalie, for, for joining us today. It's my pleasure, thank you for having me. Yeah, and Shanti, thanks for stopping in as well. Thank you, and thank you again, Natalie. I really appreciate the conversation. Yeah, and if you want to uh, be a part of part three of Making the Case for Elementary Social Studies, just head over to inquired.org slash webinar info and you will be taken there and you can sign up for uh, part three where we talk to district leaders to talk about the specific policies at the district level that are advocating for and mandating for elementary social studies. Thank you. Martin, so I want to give a quick plug to preview. We're talking about adding a part four that goes into curriculum design. And I think that um, in terms of thinking about building background knowledge, and I, I think based on some of the conversation that was going on here at Martin, I think we should think about that. You think we should think about that? Yeah. yeah. I, think, I, think, I think of part four. We're getting a yes, please. So yeah, okay. I think a part four might be in the works. Okay, we will, we will definitely do that. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks all. Bye.